Welcome to Pop Culture Retro, which was recently voted the 15th best podcast by the residents of the Golden Years Retirement Community in Boca Raton, Florida. Each show, we'll revisit some of your favorite pop culture memories with insider and outsider perspectives. Now, please help me welcome your hosts, Ike Eisenman and Jonathan Rosen. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Pop Culture Retro. I'm one of your hosts, Jonathan Rosen, along with Ike Eisenman, and we are in for a treat today. We have someone that you all grew up with, someone very popular and was on everything in the 70s and 80s, and uh, as big a fan as I was, I think my sister was even a bigger fan, but uh, welcome, <laughs> Matthew Laberto. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, love being here and uh, talking to my uh, childhood friend, Ike Eisman. So, <laughs> good to meet you, Jonathan. <laughs> nice to meet you. And well, let me hear right first. You guys met in Little House. I mean, right? That's that's. Am I getting that right? Well, I you know I was sitting here trying to figure that out myself, and I felt like I had to ask uh, Matthew that question because I, I yeah I feel like we it, we were just kids that that grew up in the business together. Ike's just a few years older than, than I am, but we always knew of each other. We were at the same auditions. Our families knew each other. Uh, our brothers were friends throughout the years. So I, I felt long, even before Little House, we, uh, we knew of each other. Yeah, it, it's, it, it was one of those things that like both our families are show business families. And so yeah. it just sort of kind of makes sense that we would cross paths and then we spent time together. And, you know, that led to uh, essentially a, you know, lifelong, lifelong friendship. Yeah. But I will say this, I have to I have to do this right away because I don't think I've ever said this to you, Matthew, yeah. or in front of you. I'm going to do it publicly now. But okay. for me, um, growing up as a child, competitive child actor, and we all were, the only <laughs> other child actor that I was intimidated by was you, was Matthew. Really? Lever. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, don't I mean, think you've even, ever told me that. Even okay, good. Well, see, now's a good time to do it. <laughs> but even as I grew up, before I got into the business and seeing, you know, I'm, I don't know what the time frame actually is, but even as I first started and was doing shows, of course, Little House was a show I wanted a you know a chance to be on, and I would see you on that show, and I would think, man, I'm so glad he's on a series, so I don't have to run into him right now at auditions because it's not going to go my way. He's off the so, circuit. I can yeah. win a couple tournaments. Yeah, just for a while, you know, just for a while. But uh, well, no, they, you, coming from uh, you, my friend, you were one of the uh, the most working kid actors uh, as well. So you certainly. Uh, we're right up there, and uh, I, I appreciate uh, you saying that. And I got to say, our friendship has really grown over the years because when when you're 11 and 14 or 11 and 15, it's a big difference maturity oh. wise and what we're into. And you yeah, know, I mean, there was definitely enough of an age difference back yeah. then. But then you know, you hit 30, and it's who cares? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. And we'll get into this more later. But Matthew and I ended up working together uh, for quite a number of years in the uh, the ADR business, voiceover industry, and we'll kind of touch upon yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's touch upon that later. with that. I, I, I'll start. I'll start with Little House, if it's okay. I, sure. you know, I, I I did a lot of research and a lot of things yesterday, and I, you know. I guess I totally forgot that you you played Michael Landon as a kid <laughs> before you got the regular part of the series. I mean, how is that that all of a sudden, this, oh, look, a kid that just happens to look like I did is wandering around. Did, was that even mentioned at all <laughs> when you came in? No, it, it, it was sort of a don't ask, don't tell thing, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I, for those of you... Uh, people listening that don't uh, watch Little House on the Prairie or knew a little bit about it, but not really. Uh, I played Charles Ingalls, Michael Landon, as a little boy in flashbacks to his childhood. And there were two very sweet episodes. One uh, season, I think it was season three, maybe. And then the second was season four, where he had a flashback and he's on a train going to visit his sick parents or his sick mother and uh, or sick father, I think. And on the train, he reminisces about his childhood. And it was a really lovely episode. The next season, he wrote an episode where Ma met Pa in grade school. And again, it was called I Remember, I Remember uh, for the fans of the show. And again, it was just one of those sweet, touching, I watch it with my kids. I just watched it the other day with my stepkids. I'm married now. I have two stepkids, and they'd never seen it. 
my <laughs> my goddaughter and my friend's kids all went through their little house phase and watched them all. So it was uh, it was it's fun sharing that with them. And then Michael uh, Landon wrote the part of his adopted son, Albert. He was just an orphan in the show and later became uh, his adopted son and asked me to do it because I had already had a connection with the show. And I was more than happy to do it because as Ike said, Little House on the Prairie at the time was one of the shows that everybody just, yeah, they just, uh, apart from just the popularity of it, everybody wanted to work on it. They wanted to work with Landon. They they knew that it was a, a such a family crew and and cast and it, it was just something that everyone sort of strove to to work towards so i i just got very lucky well uh, did, i'm glad you mentioned it because i was looking at some of the guests i mean you had everyone who was anybody in that show at some point or another and it, people also that went on to huge careers afterwards that sure like you know one of the some of their earliest roles were in your show uh i mean you had gone in that you had already had an established career you had been in a lot of things before <clears> then <throat> But were you at all intimidated to go into this hugely popular show? No, um, I, I never really felt intimidated when I was a kid in situations like that. I guess it benefited me because I never had to worry about freezing up or, you know, <laughs> being caught like a deer in the headlights. It was just a really lovely thing. I enjoyed doing it and I understood what it was, but uh, it was just it was just an environment that allowed me to do what I wanted to do better is all. And when, when you're uh, talking about uh, the actors that either began their careers and went on to have terrific careers or some of the all time most popular stars that were on the show, Little House on the Prairie was one of those last shows where maybe Love Boat or Fantasy Island or one of those sort of early 80s shows, but they used uh, so many really amazing old school stars really um uh, like sylvia sydney people wouldn't know who she was but she was a huge star in the 40s and 50s uh ray bulger the scarecrow from the wizard of oz did a guest uh part a couple guest episodes on the show and my character and his he was sort of a town bum and i was the town orphan when the ingles moved away into a, a new town and left walnut grove so I got to work with Ray Bolger of all people. And you don't get any of that anymore. That, that mixture of old Hollywood on a television show was, was kind of rare, you know? It, it just doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, the the uh, one of the episodes that yeah, I, uh, I I don't know, know if I had anything on this. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, because one of the episodes I I guessed <clears throat> uh, guessed it on on Little House because I got a chance to do two, which was amazing for me. But Theodore Bikel yeah played uh, my father as a Russian oh. immigrant and you know a huge um, uh, movie star from um, you know from an earlier era. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was my direct connect connection to that. But I just wanted to touch upon what. Um, what Matthew just said about the family environment on that on that set. Um, I one of the great things for me about working at Disney was it truly was a family. I mean, the, the the crew, the crews were always kind of the same on each project. And everywhere you went, you knew someone and they created that kind of an environment. And I adored working there until I went and worked on Little House. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is like 10 <laughs> notches above that. Everyone there was no com it just seemed from my perspective and Matthew of course you were there every day for a long time but I didn't see you know competition on the on the set I didn't see people you know at odds with each other everyone worked so seamlessly and so well together yeah even even when things were awkward or difficult um you know everyone just acknowledged it and moved on or got over it and I thought that was an extraordinary thing um that set was one of the best the best set I worked on I think period of my career really wow yeah I I agree so, with that and and uh, sorry Jonathan not to cut you off but no, no. Uh, um I felt like there was a competitiveness on the show which is healthy when somebody comes in and sort of does something you know, a notch above, well, everybody else raises their game up to sort of lift themselves up and, and follow suit. And, but there wasn't the undercutting, there wasn't the sabotaging that 
is so <laughs> common and so uh, prevalent in a lot of shows that I was on after Little House on the Prairie. And I got a big, it was a big rude awakening after that because I thought every, <laughs> every set in Hollywood was uh, like a Michael Landon show and it wasn't. Um, but uh, yeah, and I, and I have to say really briefly, as Ike said, I was the kid actor that got Little House and got a lot of the other parts. Ike Eisman was the Disney kid. <laughs> and let, let's keep it real here for a second. Because I, always, I always wanted to do a Disney movie. I auditioned for every single one of them, just like all of the kid actors of, of that era. I did the animation tests for a, a movie called Pete's Dragon that they remade a couple of years ago. <laughs> Uh, guy, a kid uh, who was uh, friends of ours named Sean Marshall wound up getting it. Yep. And I was this like Latin dark haired kid. I auditioned for everything. It was down between me and one or two other kids. And they always went with the red hair, you know, toe hair <laughs> kid or whatever. And uh, I never got it. So never, ever did a Disney Disney film. So you oh, got me on that one. I, well, I, you know what? It's, well played. it's like, yeah. <laughs> what, what can I say? What can I say? I'll take it. <laughs> I'm going to ask about uh, Michael Landon a little bit, if you can. I mean, was he as impossibly nice as he as he appeared as seemed to everyone? I mean, just looking at him back then, I mean, it's like such a wholesome figure portrayed, you know, yeah. was he that nice in real life? You know, Landon was Landon was a, a just a star. I, I, I don't know if people have been around a star. You know, they they emanate this otherworldly glow, and Landon had that. He was incredibly funny, one of the funniest men I probably ever know in my life. Super talented. He could seamlessly switch from being a director to a writer to an actor. He was a wonderful actor. I think he was a very underrated actor, actually, because that wasn't really his main focus or what he sort of put his energy into. He was always behind the scenes and directing. He was a stellar director, wrote all of the parts uh, that uh, my character, Albert, the big episodes, and my character always seemed to burn down something or get hooked on drugs or you know some <laughs> terrible thing but those were all michael landon for the most part those were all michael landon episodes that he wrote and he was just a lovely sweet guy a lot of sets at that time and even still were closed sets we were working on first paramount then we moved over to mgm which is now sony pictures and they were doing chips and dallas and all those uh, falcon crest and all those kind of popular 80 shows at the time and they were all closed sets you couldn't visit them and landon had an open set policy come on in you're on a tour you're visiting you're from out of town you can watch us just be quiet be respectful and uh, then he'd come over and hold court and entertain them all and make them laugh and it was just uh he, he was a, a magical kind of guy for something so wholesome i i read also that you know this show in my mind it was like such a wholesome show, sweet show. And looking back when I was, when, you know, I told me that you were coming on and started doing research, there were, like you just mentioned, there were so many heavy episodes. I mean, a ton more than I remember. <laughs> there were like some yeah. really like, you know, tear jerking episodes in that. Yeah, we, uh, we definitely cried a lot. <laughs> I was just going to say, if, if, if there was anybody who had to cry, it was like Michael or Matthew. <laughs> oh, well, that's, that's one of the things I saw in the interview, in old interviews. I saw Melissa Gilbert refer to you as like, you know, a great crier. <laughs> so that, you, right. that you could cry at a moment's notice or something. Yeah. I, that, yeah, I guess, I guess I have that on my resume. Check check that box. That's, and that's a fascinating thing because that's what partially like what what I admired so much about you that you could dig out this raw gut wrenching emotion that I never quite tapped into. And I was so grateful that I wasn't actually tasked with it very often. I usually needed ammonia capsules or something to like to get the tears flowing. But man, you know, watching you do that. And I think I saw Michael actually do it in front of me on set where he got, he got all welled up, you know, once they, he, they roll camera and he went from zero to, to waterworks and no time at all. And I just was like, I'm, this is not my, this is a business I should be in, man. These guys are <laughs> world-class athlete actors, you know, it's, <laughs> well, but yeah. It has to be difficult. Not, not even kidding. I mean, all kidding aside with that, that has to be a difficult thing just to like go, you know, just 
start the war to works, I guess, you know, for a scene, no? You know, I, I guess it's just a, um, it's just a, a gear that you have in your car. You either have it or you got to work for it. And, you know, if, if you're not great with squeezing tears out, then, uh, <laughs> then there are other emotions you can, that you can use to, I, I mean, I see a lot of actors that never cry on TV, but I feel just as sucked in by what they're doing to show emotion. And there are other ways that you can, you can uh, get to it. Um, and for me, unfortunately, I couldn't, I couldn't just turn on the tears without feeling the weight of the emotion in my heart, in my soul, you know? And I wish I could because it, it, it um, you know, sometimes I had to feel like my world was falling apart inside <laughs> to be able to get the tears. Sure. And, uh, it was it wasn't always the best feeling to to have. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, I, I know it does to me because even if I couldn't bring up the tears, just the action, you know, the the process of getting to, into the emotional space, whatever it might be, sometimes even being happy go lucky and a whole lot of fun is just as taxing. But yeah, that's it a, it's emotionally, yeah. it's truly emotionally draining. And one of the things that you know, I was always grateful for being on a set when you're working in, in film is that, you know, you have breaks in between. There's a period of time where at least you get a, a, you know, a moment or two or many minutes and sometimes at least an hour between, uh, between the work you have to do to kind of like recover a little bit, but then you got to drag yourself back into it. So, sure. you know, I, I, I know it totally makes sense to me and I get that. And I can, I, I, I could well imagine what an exhausting day it would be after, you know, going through all of that. Yeah. And, and you make a good point that the most difficult uh, thing about that was um, having to go to school. Well, there it is. You know, I, I, yes, exactly. Kids. So yeah. I'm, at, I, I'm, we're in school and I'm doing algebra or English or writing a report <laughs> about something with our, our tutors. And we had little schoolhouses on, on the sets. And uh, when we were filming, uh, for those of you that uh, are not in the business or don't know things like this, we would all do interiors at uh, the studio. So dinner at Nellie's Merkin or Nellie's restaurant or in the little house, it would all be inside a stage. And then when we had the exteriors at the town, we had the entire town built out in a place called Simi Valley here in California. And then we had a schoolhouse off to the side so the cameras wouldn't see it. But if we're doing a, an extremely heavy show and you know my dog just died, and I'm in the middle of an algebra test. And then the assistant director <laughs> calls and says, yeah, we need Matt on set. Well, I have 10 minutes to go to switch gears from one to the other. And that really was the most difficult thing. It wasn't about getting to the emotional place. It was about switching gears quickly, you know, getting ready for a race or, you know, whatever. You got to warm up. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because it's, it's, it's the one aspect of being a child actor that people do not realize. Um, yeah. Because you, you're, yeah, you're being a student, you're being a kid, you could, you know, they're there educating you for the sake, for your own sake. And then, yeah, you got to go out there and, you know, put on a show and, and tap dance. So, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate it. Well, I, you know, I didn't even think of that aspect of it. I mean, so your TV then, I mean, just much more intense because what is it, a week or two weeks to do an episode? How, how long do you have? Yeah, it's it's go go go. Uh, for a little house, we it was somewhere between eight and ten days, depending on the episode, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, you you definitely wanted to to crank it out. I, I've not done that many feature films. Ike's done many more feature films than I have. He had much more of a film career than I did. Uh, I was in um, some interesting movies when when I was very young, so I was a little too young to sort of be a part of the whole system. I was just you know, maybe seven, eight, nine, ten ish So it, it was a little over my head at that time. I just knew that I went on, did my part and, and went home. But um, I've heard from friends of mine that had more movie careers that it's much more, you know, two, three, four scenes a day or not 20 or 25. So. Wow. Oh yeah, the pacing in a feature film is could be excruciatingly slow, and I, and I, and I, I wanted to mention because yeah, it is interesting. Your your I know your shooting schedule for Little House was always throughout the school year. You probably never dipped into summer, 
And my uh, Disney career was always, almost always during the <laughs> summer, all of the wonderful world of Disney projects I shot were like in August. So I was not in school. So I did have breaks and I, I didn't immediately go to the school thing like, like you did because you were under that, yeah, that separate pressure for that yeah. period of time with a show that was as, as emotionally heavy as, as Little House could be at times. But yeah, I had probably many more experiences where I had a chance to be a kid on set, do my job and kind of run around the Disney ranch, you know, or the, the studio lot in my downtime where I didn't have to, I didn't have to be in school. Well, but yeah. You, you would be wrong about that, my friend. Au contraire, mon frere. Because <laughs> I, I don't think, I, I don't think there was a, a summer that I didn't work. Oh, especially okay, awesome. No, wow. good. Well, because think of it, you you have to, when you have a, a kid actor, you have to carve out time for school. During yeah. summer, you don't have to worry about that. That's three hours that wow. you, it's three bonus hours to film. So we sort of had, I never went to summer camp and never went to, I guess my summer camp, Ike summer camp was working on a film, which a lot of kids who went to summer camp said, man, I wish I would have done that. Yeah. But, and it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't, um, the dregs of the world we we had a lot of fun together and we grew up with a lot it was great to be on a show with a lot of kids maybe if i was the only kid on the show it would have been a little more difficult but we actually had a very good time but we had to work throughout the summers yeah yeah how, how awesome was that set to i mean being as a kid that looked like an awesome place to just hang out and play around with though yeah it was like a big ghost town or a big you know hide and right. seek and you you know it was it was it was your backyard it was, uh, I gotta say, uh, it's an interesting life growing up as a, a, a kid actor, but my experience was a very good one. And uh, there, there were a lot of uh, real positive things about it. I, I don't look back uh, bitter or anything like that. Well, for someone who, who had such a good time, this is one of the things that I wanted to ask here. For someone who had such a good time on the show with the Ingalls family, your character ran away five times, I read yesterday. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I cried a lot and I ran away a lot. <laughs> do, you, do you still do you still go watching the shows now? I mean, you said you said you watched it now with uh, the kids, but do you still watch it a lot or tune in to see yourself or no? No, not really. I mean, it's it's. Um, uh, I I was listening to your uh, sci-fi oh, countdown. You were going to bring uh, that up. <laughs> yeah, uh, and Ike was talking about uh, Escape from Witch Mountain always playing on on different cable channels, and Little House is the same way. It was on Hallmark Channel. I think now it's on a, a channel called uh, Inspire, and it just bops around, and they'll go through the entire run, and then maybe another uh, cable channel will pick it up and show them. And I don't really watch them every now and again if, if I'm flipping through the channels at night and it, it, I see it on the screen and I'll say, oh, and I'll watch it for five minutes to see what the episode was. But more, more often than that, the only time I really see it now is when my kids are watching it or have a question or my, my goddaughter, hmm. or my kids' kids, and they're all sort of the age of being curious about it. Um, so I get to enjoy it through them. Now, I would speak, getting back to the, you said about the podcast, Ike, Ike was telling me earlier that you had a problem with uh, a couple of the things that we listed on the podcast for the sci-fi, that you classified them as horror instead of sci-fi. We have to hear which ones. It, <laughs> so. You know what? It, I, it's not that I had an issue. I wasn't, you know, ah, damn you. I wasn't you know, yelling, <laughs> yelling at the at the screen as I, as I was listening. My wife and I were... Uh, <laughs> sitting in the jacuzzi having a glass of wine listening to the uh, uh we, we could you know things life could be worse but um i i just i couldn't honestly i couldn't have participated in that conversation because the line gets too blurry between sci-fi and horror and fantasy and so many of the shows that you would throw out a, a name and my wife and I kind of <laughs> we're, we're having a little back and forth. And I was like, what are you talking about? That is clearly fantasy. That is not sci-fi. Sci-fi needs to be in the future and it needs to be uh, mechanical. It needs to science fiction. And then, I, and then as I said it out loud, I thought, well, wait a minute. No, that's not really right because this is a, so it's, it's really difficult how you can't really put one thing that the crossover genres really muddy the waters. 
Oh, I, I, I could not, I could not agree more because yeah, I, the, the only one that came to mind for Jonathan and I initially was okay. Alien. We can definitely say that falls under horror or, you know, or even uh, supernatural almost like it's, it's almost like a ghost story in a sense. So yeah, a lot of these films really do uh, cross over that way and, and it makes it uh, makes it kind of difficult but that's funny because yeah it how it's how it touches you personally because i am sure. i'm generally speaking a very hardcore sci-fi guy because i don't know if you made it all the way to the end but my number one pick was thx 1138 THX. which is which is right, just yeah. which is as pure sci-fi i think as you can get and i've even read other people who have mentioned that that same thing so that's why i put it as number one because it it does not cross over yeah. Unless, you know, you want to call it a horror film, which I think it really kind of is horrific. But <laughs> but anyway, I appreciated your uh, your reaction at any in any event. <laughs> and and I, 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 I will give an honorable mention to a film. It might not make a lot of people's lists, but there was a movie called Brainstorm that in the 80s, early 80s, that I absolutely adored. And Douglas Trumbull, you were talking about Douglas Trumbull with Silent Running. Yeah. And then he was the effects supervisor, I guess, on Star Wars. Is that yes. what he is? Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And he also directed, um, uh, what was it? I lost my train of thought. Uh, Brainstorm, yeah. uh, which was the Christopher Walken, Natalie Wood movie where Natalie Wood unfortunately passed away in the middle of, of filming. That's and, why that movie sounded familiar. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it's right. a, a, a friend of mine. I haven't talked to him in many, many years, but he actually wrote one of the feature films that I was in when I was a kid. And we became friends. Uh, and his name is Bruce Joel Rubin. He actually won an Oscar for writing Ghost, the uh, Demi oh, Moore, wow. uh, Patrick Swayze movie. And he's just a fantastic writer. He's written more scripts than, than people would know. Um, and a lot of the times he's very behind the scenes. I remember he was sort of the go-to script doctor uh, at the time. But Brainstorm uh, was this, uh, for those of you who didn't see it, was this scientific couple, a man and a woman, Chris Walken and Louise Fletcher, who was in uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And they created a device that could record your thoughts. And then she winds up dying while she has the device on her head. And the whole thought is, did what the hell is it like to to watch a video of someone or a recording of someone passing on what what's that like and then the sort of mystery ensues and to me that was super sci-fi the movie i i don't know if it holds up nowadays it's you know such an 80s film but it was it was so mesmerizing to me and i read the original script that was probably the best script i've ever read in my life and i I won't say what it was out of respect for for Mr. Rubin or because I, I don't have his permission to to talk about it. But uh, it was the brainstorm I did was one small section of what the entire script was. And there were too many things to get into. So they just focused just on that part. But the original script was amazing. Yeah. Now that you bring it up, uh, the what it was about, I remember seeing it, but it's been a really long time and it it didn't. Uh necessarily stick with me i think i need to yeah. revisit it because there's some other ones yeah i want to revisit for uh for another project that i'm that i'm working on but at any event um and yeah and so my wife my wife also had never seen thx uh i call it 1138 is it 1138 is that more correct i don't think there's i don't yeah. think there's a correct right or way. incorrect i think it yeah. goes either way yeah. yeah well she had never seen it I, it's been years since i've seen it so because of your podcast we're actually gonna watch it and uh <laughs> show it to her so oh Thank my you. gosh so you're gonna probably end up seeing like george lucas's new version of it unless you with the added stuff I, the i'm added not a big stuff. i'm not a big fan of the added stuff yeah, yeah I, I, and i <laughs> If she hasn't, if you haven't seen it or haven't seen it in a long time, it might not throw you off because it's not as jarring as what he did with Star Wars, etc. But uh, it's okay. it's actually kind of seamless. But anyway, the you know the basic obviously film is is still there. But yeah, I'd be interested to hear what. Uh, <laughs> what yeah, we'll talk. <laughs> we'll, we'll right, talk. All right, yeah. <laughs> They don't even they don't even sell the older versions of his movies anymore. They don't they they wipe the shelves of them. No, like yeah, the Star Wars. I, they, yeah, you can't even find them anymore. Oh <laughs> so, wow. Well, yeah, if, which if I'm really have, glad. If you have copies, hold on to them. That's oh, yeah. I always do. I I mean, we yeah. go back to our VHSs that we still keep um, around this house. So. Yeah, I, uh, I, I've got my DVDs of some of those things, and I'm actually getting ready to, you can get 
the original THX 1138. That's for you, Matthew, um, <laughs> on on eBay. So I'm probably going to buy uh, a DVD version just so I have it in my collection because it's he he tries so hard to wipe all those old things away. Hmm. Well, uh, yeah, I, I do want to ask Matthew if this, if one of the things that because in my mind one of the things that you probably thought was boys from Brazil was not sci-fi. Is that one of them <laughs> or no? Um, yeah, I I would. Yeah, but Boys from Brazil was the cloning, so that's science right. fictiony. All right, so that's and, uh, we'll accept that. <laughs> but but again, that's that's you could make you could make a valid argument one way or the other. So yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right, so I'll I'll get back here. I'll finish up my my little house questioning to go on to something else. I just want now at the end, I remember this. I remember watching at the time when they like kind of sort of maybe killed you off. I remember even then like what the hell, <laughs> you, know, what, you know, what are they doing? But it's, it's you could look at it and not really, because later they said that she, you came back later. So what, what made you, did you decide to leave the show? You were doing another project at the time? It, well, first of all, I think Albert was a goner. I mean, if you, if you had to, uh, <laughs> if Han shot first or right. Guido, or what's the guy's name? Guido? The, Guido, Guido. Yeah, Guido. Yeah. Um, I, I would say, I would say Albert's unfortunately a goner because essentially I had leukemia and back then you didn't recover from leukemia. No. <laughs> and then they added in, I, I think when they added in, there was one tagline on one of the episodes of Laura saying, and my brother Albert many years later, but there was actually, right. before, I feel like that was an episode before the episode where I quote unquote died. So I think it was maybe they kind of tripped themselves up and just never bothered Address correcting it. It, addressing it. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I wasn't uh, asking off the show, honestly. I, I love that show. I would have done it for another five or 10 years. I mean, who wouldn't? It was, it was a wonderful show and a great life. And, and it's all people that you grew up with and loved working with. I think the show had just sort of run its course. And I, uh, at the time, I was doing a show called Whiz Kids that was a sort of right around the time of war games. It was sort of the TV version of uh, war games. Some uh, computer, you know, wizard kid and his three best friends uh, would break into, you know, the Pentagon, like, <laughs> We're in, you know, that's all you had to do. He just had a, key, <laughs> yeah. just had a keyboard. My wife always looks at me and goes, let's hack the Pentagon. We're in. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I was doing that show at the time. And uh, the last season that they were, they're ending the show. I came back for three episodes, two or three episodes, two that I can remember. It might've been one more. One where my character was severely on uh, drugs. That was a, another really heavy episode. And then the very last one was, uh, I came back and I was very ill and it was sort of a swan song and saying goodbye to my sister and my family. And uh, the episode really was, was also about Laura coming to grips of, with losing her brother. And for those of you, this has really taken a deep dive. If you're a big, <laughs> huge fan of uh, Little House on the Prairie, you're a, they call them bonnet heads, I think is the, is the exact term. <laughs> but uh, my girlfriend on that episode, who is also my girlfriend in another season, two, three years before, she played my girlfriend twice, who is one of my all-time best friends from the time we were nine, 10 years old. And her youngest daughter is my goddaughter, is an actress named oh, wow. Mulder Hardin, who, uh, oh, if wow. people are big friends, uh, big fans of The Office, she played yeah. Jan, Michael's boss on The Office when she went crazy and made her serenity candles by Jan. And, and just, uh, <laughs> she was amazing in that, in that, uh, that show, I absolutely uh, adored her in uh, The Office. But she was uh, my girlfriend in the final episode. And yeah, and we say goodbye to Albert. That was the end of that. Uh, uh, I know with Melora, I'm a big fan of, of hers. So, well, I didn't know that you guys were friends still. Like, But all I know is that, because I, I think she's great, the Back to the Future thing with her, <laughs> that she was the original cast at that. That's yeah. when I never knew that until recently. Blows my mind that she was the original uh, choice. Yeah, that was, a, I mean, you could probably do a whole podcast on on stuff like that. She and Eric Stoltz, right, was the original right. actor. And then yeah. Eric Stoltz just wasn't cutting it for whatever reason. Cutting it, that's what I feel. Yeah. You know, he was a wonderful actor, a big actor in the 80s. And they replaced him with Michael J. Fox. And Melora was about three feet taller than Michael J. Fox. Right. So they went with another girl who's uh, named Claudia, 
who mm-hmm. was a very good friend of mine, and she wound up replacing Melora, and they, the two were friends. They, uh, her name was Claudia Wells, was the actress. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there you go. Hollywood, strange things happen. Amazing. Oh, I, 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 those are some of my favorite stories, actually. And, and, um, it, it, uh, let's see, even, even when it came to, uh, to Witch Mountain, and I ended up getting this confirmed through the archives, uh, Kim Richards and I screen tested for it together, uh, obviously, and we went on to do it. But, um, Melissa Sue Anderson and, uh, Willie Ames actually screen tested really? for it. Yeah. Um, and wow. I, I had never heard that's the first time I've heard that. Well, you'll wow. en- you'll appreciate the story, and I have to tell it because when I walked on the set my first day on my first episode of uh, guest starring on Little House, yeah. um, an AD took me up to the makeup station as- after I got into wardrobe, and I saw everyone was sitting there, including you, and you were you were there. I think it's like all all the kids were getting made up together, and. Melissa Gilbert said hi to me and she was very sweet and open and all of a sudden it went down and it got to Melissa Sue Anderson and she turned around and she said, you're that Witch Mountain kid, aren't you? And I said, "Uh, yeah. She said, you know, Willie Ames and I were supposed to do that movie, but we had other commitments, so we couldn't and that's why you did it. And then she turned right back around and I thought... Okay, nice to meet you too. I'm not sure what that means, you know, because I thought you're starring on a major network series. And, you know, I did this little Disney movie. I think it all worked out in the end, but okay, whatever. So I was, I was really kind of shocked, by, <laughs> shocked by that. But you, you know, I, I guess we all have those things that we just don't quite let go of, don't yeah. we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously, I, I remembered it quite well for a long time for a certain reason. But uh, hey, you know, there it is. But oh, yeah, oh, that's a great ca- story. Those casting choices like that have always fascinated me. One of my, just I know we're like digressing for a moment, but one of my absolute favorite things, uh, favorite DVD commentaries of all time is uh, The Godfather, listening to Coppola talk about all the casting choices that that the producers tried to hoist upon him and how the, the cast that ended up in the film was his original choice and the, yeah. the screen test they show of, of you know, the, the other actors, even Robert De Niro, I think, you know, auditioning for uh, Al Pacino's part. Yeah, and or Sonny, no, was yeah. it Sonny? I don't remember. Well, that's I, the one that, that I saw, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just, I, because it's so hard you know, even something you've been in yourself, you mythologize uh, after so much time and you can't imagine anybody else having done it or what kind of project it, it would have been had it been cast in other directions. So, and I know Back to the Future is probably the most famous one because, um, you know, clearly, you know, decisions are made and, and it, maybe it's not looking so good for the success of the film with even a, a consummate actor like Eric Stoltz. I love his work. So there you go. Yeah, I think I find that stuff really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love hearing those stories, too. Uh, I'll, I'll have a couple more questions about uh, just showbiz stuff that you did. And then we want to transition to something else. But when, you know, I watched the two episodes that you were in of shows that I loved. I watched the Love Boat one. <laughs> and, and, but the, my, you were on one of my three favorite uh, shows, episodes from Amazing Stories. I love that show. And the fine tuning episode, I just watched it again yesterday, remembered how much I enjoyed it as a kid. And what was that like to work with, you know, you got Milton Berle in the show, you know, a legend. Can you tell me about that one, that experience a little bit? Yeah, uh, wow, you bring back some memories. Um, It really was Galaxy Quest before Galaxy Quest, which is another one of my wife's and my uh, favorite movies of all time. guy named a uh, fantastic actor uh, slash director named Bob Balaban directed that episode. Um, people who know him from uh, Waiting for Guffman and Best in Show and all the Christopher Guest movies. And he's just a brilliant, brilliant, uh, very dry comedic actor. He also uh, was in, uh, had a very large role in Seinfeld. He played uh, the head of NBC, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, people would know him from that. Uh, but he was an absolute joy to work with, wonderful director. Uh, Milton Burl was Milton Burl. Uh, the other kids on the show uh, uh, sort of butted heads with him for some reason. I don't 
really? remember the reason why. Yeah, but something happened, or maybe he was a little sarcastic to him, and they didn't get it, or whatever. He treated me wonderfully. He and I got along great, and I absolutely uh, enjoyed being around him. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just a really, really interesting episode for those of you that are listening to this that uh, have never saw it. It's essentially a galaxy quest. It's a, a race of aliens that come to Earth and they learn about Earth culture through watching old 50s television shows. So I Love Lucy and Dick Van Dyke show and Milton <laughs> Berle and, and all that. And then they, uh, uh, my character builds a, a very high power radio antenna that intercepts the signal and I, uh, uh, realize that they're actually coming to earth to visit and I have a date. So me and my three high school buddies or junior high school buddies go to Hollywood Boulevard. And then we see these aliens that clearly <laughs> look like aliens with, you know, hats on and <laughs> trench coats. So it was kind of ridiculous. And the Groucho glass, Groucho mustache. <laughs> right. The Groucho, <laughs> the glasses and the big <laughs> nose and the schnoz yes. and the mustache. <laughs> But uh, yeah, and it was just, it was a very sweet, lighthearted episode and uh, just really super fun to work on. I, I, yeah, I had a blast. Well, with that, we're going to end part one of our talk with Matthew Laberto. Please check in with part two next week. Thank you for watching. This is Jonathan Rosen with Ike Eisenman, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Pop Culture Retro, where no one was hurt during the making of this podcast. 